The part of the chapter here we're going to be focusing in on, there's actually quite a few portions. We're going to start off there in verses number 1 and 2. Bible reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, after you get saved, after Jesus Christ gives you that free gift of salvation, it doesn't stop there. You know, yes, we believe that salvation is easy. We believe it's a free gift. It wasn't easy for Christ, but it's easy for us. God loves us. He wants us to get saved. But see, that's not where Christianity ends. That's where it starts. Receiving that free gift, having that new life, you know, a lot of people will, will condemn the way that we believe that, that hey, man, salvation's free. It's by grace. You don't have to work for it. You just receive it for free. And people say, oh, yeah, well, then that means you can just do whatever you want. And you're still saved. Yes, it does. Yes, that's exactly what it means. You can do whatever you want and you're still saved because salvation is a gift. You don't earn it and you don't work for it. Amen. Now, should we do that? Absolutely not. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, as Romans chapter 6 says. But what we're seeing here is a pretty high calling saying that we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice. He said, now Jesus Christ made a sacrifice for us. Now, in thanksgiving for what he's done, the Bible says our reasonable service to him. He says that's perfectly reasonable. And it is. If you want to reason it out, is it reasonable to offer up your life now as a living sacrifice to the one who saved your soul from eternity of hell? Very reasonable indeed, especially considering he gave it to you for free and you're not even required to do this. He's saying, look, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Now offer up yourself as a living sacrifice and don't let those words, you know, skip by a living sacrifice. Your life, the way that you live ought to be one of where you're sacrificing for the Lord. That's what he wants for us to do. But I'm going to get a little bit more specific here. Look at verse number two. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, we're different. We're changed. Once you got saved, you had a new creature. We need to, to stop being like the world. See, the world is basically run by Satan. Satan is the God of this world right now. All things that are, that are not of God are of the world. And we need to make sure that, you know, prior to salvation and just living in this world, it's easy to become conformed to this world. It's easy to start acting and doing things like all those around you, like the way the world thinks, the things that the world does. But we're called not only to be a living sacrifice, to, but to change and transform our mind. We need to, to think differently. We need to think with a godly attitude. And um, there's a mindset that we ought to have as Christians, and it's completely different than that of the world. So everything that you see on the TV, all the movies, all the TV shows, everything that gets pumped into your head where you start to understand this is normal, this is acceptable, it's programming. And they're trying to get you to accept a certain way, the world's way of thinking. We need to be transformed and be different from that, be separate from that, and don't let that influence you. And you know, one of the best ways to not let the TV influence you is get rid of your TV. I haven't had any, you know, cable TV or you're watching any programming in I don't even know how many years at this point. Now, we, if you walk into my house, you'll see a TV, but it's hooked up to a DVD player. We watch document, you know, there's certain things that we allow. You know, it's not that the, the device itself is wicked. It's the programming that's wicked. And we need to be aware of that. So the sitcoms and the, the Hollywood movies and all that stuff that's being pumped, that's being crammed down your throat, it, it is an agenda that they don't call it television programming for nothing because it is programming. You are being programmed into a way of thinking whether you realize it or not. And if you're saved this morning and you watch TV regularly, I'll challenge you to, to get rid of it or just stop watching TV for a month. And then if you turn it back on again, you'll see a lot more clearly about how wicked what you've been watching really is. If you go an extended period of time without watching it and then replace that with getting in the Bible, Whatever time that you would normally spend, whatever show you normally watch, 
Read your Bible for that time. And then go back to it and see what, I mean, I don't even recommend going back to it, but if you do go back to it, you'll see a lot of things, because what happens is you progressively get used to things. Things that used to bother you. Things that might come on where someone blasphemes the name of Christ. Right? When you first start to hear that, it bothers you. Ooh, man, it stings. Like, man, I wish they wouldn't say that. But you know what? When you let, allow yourself to continue watching that filth, after a while, it doesn't bother you anymore. You can just keep on going. And, you know, that's the way that television has been going. That's why they have to introduce things slowly. And they shock you a little bit here and shock you there. And I'm old enough now. I remember when the sodomite agenda was really being pushed hard. They started by doing it with the, with the comedy where they would have some homosexual be the, the, the comic relief, right? Just some flamboyant character that nobody really cared about that much that was just there for a laugh, right? That's how they introduce these characters. And then it gets to the point to where you have some, you know, perverted, you know, someone just coming out and saying that, hey, I'm, I'm a homosexual. And that, and that was a big shock to the, to the nation. And then you have, you know, a kiss happening on, you know, and it gets worse and worse and worse and more disgusted and more perverted until now it's like probably almost every single TV show out there is going to have at least one character that's a sodomite. And which is not reflective at all of what the actual population is because the population is like 2% of the people. Yet you're going to turn on the TV and what's it full of? It's full of sodomites. And it gives you this warped, one, it gives you a warped perspective on, on what reality is like, because you're getting programmed with this false, this false reality. It's false um, life. And it influences you. And not only that, then they, they put whatever agenda they want you to have of being tolerant and accepting and just, oh, everything's just fine, when it's a wicked abomination in the eyes of God. And if you're spending the time reading your Bible instead of watching TV, you'll realize how God really feels about these sins. It's not just that one sin, but that seems to be the thing that's just taken over everything. It's the adultery. It's the fornication. It's all the wickedness and drunkenness and everything that's being promoted as being fine, normal, acceptable, no big deal. Oh, yeah, of course younger, younger, younger adults are going to go out and sow their wild oats. Oh, yeah, that's just what they do. Oh, yeah, that's just acceptable. It's not acceptable according to God. And the more you just allow yourself to get into that mindset, the mind of the world the farther away you're going to be from serving God and the farther away you're going to be from offering up yourself a living sacrifice. We need to transform our minds this morning. We need an attitude adjustment. And this is something, I don't care how long you've been going to church, how long you've been saved for, we all need to do this from time to time. We need to put ourselves in check. We need to just say, what am I doing? Where do I need to improve? Am I, you know, because I don't know anyone who has this perfect sacrifice that they're offering up every single day. That's the goal. That's the objective. That's what we want to hit. But nobody's doing this perfectly. Look at verse number 3 here in Romans 12. <clears throat> For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So everything up to this point is this kind of groundwork. The main issue that I'm going to be delving into this morning when it comes to our mindset and when it comes to our attitude is this idea of people not thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to think. And we covered this a little bit on Wednesday, but I wanted to go a little bit more in depth on this issue of people who are conceited, right? That's the word that we would use today. Someone who thinks of themselves really highly, they're full of themselves, right? They're conceited. And this is something that this is definitely not just lost people who are, who are conceited. This happens to Christians just as well as anybody else. And we need to get this different mindset. See, the world's going to teach you that you have to look out for number one. Right? The world's mindset is going to be like, you got to do what you got to do. The world's going to teach you or that it's important to look good in front of other people. You need to make sure that you just look the best in front of everybody else. No matter what that means. Or just to be cool. Right? That's what the world's going to teach you how to do. That's why you have all the, you know, the, the movie stars, again, the, the media cramming down what is cool. Oh, however this person wears their hair. Oh, whatever this person's wearing, that's what everybody wants to run and do. Right? Because that's cool. And it's about their looks. Looks are vain, my friends. Your outward appearance, not important at all in God's eyes. 
Very important, very little. Let's put it that way. Very little. There are a few instances where God does actually care. Like God doesn't want us cross-dressing. Okay? Man shall not wear that to pertain to a woman, neither shall a woman put on a man's garment. For all that do shall are an abomination unto the Lord. It's an abominable thing for to be cross-dressing, to wear, you know, if you're one gender, to wear the other gender's clothing. But other than things like that, which is pretty extreme, you know, I mean, that's saying you've got a lot of flexibility in how you look, and God's not going to care about the outward appearance. What he cares about is your actions. What he cares about is what you do and what's on the inside, and that is truly what matters. But that's not really what the world teaches you. The world's going to tell you to be cool, to fit in, to, you know, to... to, to stand out as someone that everyone can look to and look to in a vain sense, not in a good sense. <clears throat> Thinking too highly of ourselves is very damaging and something we need to keep ourselves in check of and to keep ourselves humble because it's not only damaging to us, it's damaging to those around us. When you, when you start to become conceited and full of yourself, it's, it's damaging all the way around. You're, again, it's one of those things you're definitely not only impacting yourself, you're impacting everybody. When you start to think highly of yourself, guess what's next? When you think you know, yourself is, you know, I, I'm so much better, you start to look down on other people, more negatively on them, because you think you're so great. Oh, why is this person worth my time? You know, and you start, you know, the, the, the perception in your head starts to become more and more skewed the more full of yourself you get. The, the more negatively you think about other people and the more your love will wax cold towards everybody. And pride's a great sin. It's a, it's, a, it's a very large sin. God hates the sin of pride. Keep your finger here in Romans 12 because we're coming back to it. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter number 3. You read about the sin of pride in general in the Bible, it's mentioned many, many, many times. And this is, this is a sin that God can't stand. You know why God can't stand pride? Because it's coming from us. Because He looks at us and He sees the real us. He sees the sinner. He sees the, 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 you know, the, the person whose works are like filthy rags in His sight. God is a holy, perfect, just God. And when he looks at us, he says, oh, you're going to think that you're something, that you're something really special, that you're so much better than everybody else? You've done I don't know how many abominations. You know, and, and he sees these things and he knows who we are in reality. And he knows the wickedness that we've done. And he says, you have no right to lift yourself up above anybody else. And again, that's not just the, you know, not only is that the reason why we, we shouldn't be proud and lifted up, but it's completely contrary to what Christ taught anyways. The one person in this whole world that could be proud, that could lift himself up, was Jesus Christ because he was without sin. He did everything right. But what did he do? He was a servant. He went and served other people. He didn't have people wait on him and do anything like that. He gave us the example of saying, this is how you need to be. This is how you need to behave. Don't get so full of yourself. It's not about you. It's about other people. Look at Isaiah chapter 3. We're going to see here uh, the way God feels about here. He calls the daughters of Zion when they, get, they got haughty. We're going to start reading in verse number 16 of Isaiah chapter 3. Verse number 16 reads, Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. They've got their, their heads in the clouds, right? They're walking with their nose up in the air. They're stretched forth neck, right? That real proud attitude, the wanton eyes. Walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Oh, they're so cool, right? They've got the right way to strut and they've got their head necks up in the air. Look at verse number 17. Therefore... The Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Basically what it is, you know, and anytime someone's secret parts or your nakedness is being revealed, it's a shame. And it's not that hard to understand. I mean, think about how you would feel if you were just in the middle of public somewhere and all of a sudden, you know, your clothes were just gone. You'd be ashamed. You would, you'd want to get out of there as soon as possible. That is a normal reaction to have. 
But see, God's saying, you know what, I'm going to cause that to happen. You've got all your, your ornaments and you're walking around and you're thinking you're, you're, you're hot stuff. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show your nakedness unto everybody. I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to show you some shame. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 18. And that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and the round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. Now, I don't know what probably half of those things are, to be honest with you. I really don't. But it's obvious that it's talking about what they're wearing. Right? It's talking about the jewels. It's talking about the gold. It's talking about all the different things that they're putting on. They're decking themselves up. They're, 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 they're making themselves look a certain way in front of everybody. And it says, I think it's interesting in verse 18 there, it said, the bravery of all of that stuff. See, when they start putting on their costume... They start putting on their, all of these different um, jewels and apparel and, and all this stuff so that people could look at them and say, oh, how great you are. It gives them this false sense of bravery. It gives them the, this, it, it lifts them up even more. As they draw more attention to themselves, the more conceited they become, getting everyone to look at them. Oh, wow, you've got all these jewels and all this stuff. Look at how fancy that is. Look at how great that is. God hates that. He said, I'm going to take away your bravery. I'm going to make you uh, become a shame. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 24. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there should be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. God's fully capable of bringing people down and abasing them when they lift themselves up. And we need to make sure that our time is, and our energy and our focus is not spent on our outward appearance. The outward appearance is vanity. And it's going to lead you to become conceited and full of yourself when you get so focused on the things that you put on, the things that you wear, how you look in front of others on your outward appearance. The way that we should be concerned about how others view us is based on our actions. What are we doing? You know, it's, as the Bible says in, in, like, in, in James chapter 2, you know, when someone comes to you, and they're naked and they're hungry and they need stuff. And you're just like, you say with the mouth, oh yeah, go be warmed and be filled. God bless you, brother. And you don't do anything for them. It doesn't profit anybody anything. And at that point, you're just saying things because you're full of yourself. Because you don't have the right heart because you're not actually doing anything. We need to be letting our actions show people who we are, not what we're wearing on the outside. Go back, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. When you've got a mindset where you're full of yourself, where you get a conceited attitude and you think that you're so special and you're God's gift to everybody, to mankind, you're just, you are just so good at whatever. You're not going to have the proper attitude where you're supposed to be loving each other and, and serving one another. And the Christian life is a life of service. So if you ever heard, it, you know, there's different ministries, right? We have a ministry here. What does it mean to have a ministry? You're ministering. And what it means to minister is you're doing something for somebody else. That's what it means. So you see, oh, this church has this ministry and that ministry, what it is, what it's supposed to be at least. And oftentimes this actually changes. It becomes just a social club and not a, they'll call it a ministry because it sounds good. Because that's the church word to use. Right? And they'll have this, this ladies book club or something. And it's a ministry. It's not a ministry. That's a social club. Ministry means you're ministering to somebody else. We have a ministry. We have a ministry that's a soul winning ministry. Where you go out and preach the gospel to other people. We actually care about somebody else and you show them how they could be saved by putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a ministry because you are ministering to somebody else. You're taking your time and saying, you know what? This person's time is more important than my time. I'm going to go and help them out. They need this. I'm going to help them. That's what ministry is. And there's many ways to minister to people. Any, any needs that people have and you help to meet those needs, 
You're ministering unto them. Look at verse number 9 of Romans 12. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. And when he says preferring one another, it means basically above yourself. You're preferring them to you. You are, let your love, it says let your love be without dissimulation. Don't let your love be fake. Don't let it just be in word only. It ought to be real. You ought to actually care about other people. You ought to have a love for other people. And the way you do that, you can't love other people without abhorring that which is evil. You need to start hating the sin, hating wickedness, hating the things that are going to cause evil and damage and cleave to that which is good. You need to hate that which is promoting the evil. You need to start hating the programming that you're being programmed with and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Jump down to verse number 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. This world's going to have you think differently, right? When someone persecutes you, this world's going to teach you to curse them, right? You're an enemy of them. You're going to fight back. Don't let them do that to you. Do they know who they're messing with? Sound like the world's way of thinking? That's not God's way of thinking. That's not, it should not be your way of thinking. Just bless them which persecute you. Don't curse them. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Amen. We need to not be mindful, not thinking of the high things, the things that are lofty, the things that will lift you up. Shouldn't be a thing for you. It says, but condescend. Bring yourself lower. Bring yourself lower to, to men of low estate. There's a lot of poor people. There's a lot of people who are in a low estate. We shouldn't be thinking, oh, well, they're down there and I'm up here. I'm better than them. We need to bring ourselves down. Because look, let's be honest, there, you may be in a better position than other people. I mean, it's a fact of life. But the Bible's way of thinking, the way that you need to transform is to not to let that position get in your head. You need to condescend. If you're higher than someone else, bring yourself lower. Humble yourself. Bring yourself down to where they're at. And make no issue of, of where you're at versus where they're at. And love them enough to minister unto them and to care for them. And it says, be not wise in your own conceits. And we saw this on Wednesday in Proverbs 26. I'll read the verse for you in Proverbs 26, 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. And we did a whole study on the way the Bible talks about the fools and all these other things. And being wise in your own conceits, being so lifted up, and, and thinking that, you know, you're so great and the, the thoughts that come into your head, oh, they're so wise. Being wise in your own conceits is a conceited attitude and not what the Bible teaches us to do. <clears throat> so the first question you have to ask yourself is how do you esteem yourself? Now, the Pharisees in the Bible didn't, are not a, an example of the way to be. Right? The Pharisees is always something that, that Jesus was rebuking, John the Baptist was rebuking, everybody was rebuking. The Apostle Paul was rebuking the Pharisees. Why? One, because they were hypocrites. But two, because they were so full of themselves. They were proud. They were arrogant. Even when they were talking about Jesus, they say, well, which of the Pharisees believed him? Right? I mean, they were, they were trusting in their own conceits and their own supposed wisdom and knowledge and how smart they were. And they rejected Christ. They rejected the Savior as a result. In Luke 14, 11, where I, you don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. We went over this last week. When Jesus was invited to, to have a meal with, at one of the Pharisees' house, he made note of how they loved to take the uppermost rooms. He paid attention to that. He's like, wow, these guys, you know, they're so full of themselves. And I, and I went over this whole thing. How You know, Jesus is there. The one who deserves all of the glory, all of the honor, all of the respect, who deserves the greatest room at the feast. And these guys are coming in thinking that they're so great that they deserve that room for themselves. And that's the, the attitude of the Pharisee. 
They had no love. They didn't care about anyone else. They cared about themselves. And Jesus said um, in, that, in that story, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. Abased means brought really low. You think about the base of a building, it's at the bottom, right? When you exalt yourself, when you lift yourself up, you think you're so great, guess what? You're going to be brought all the way down to the bottom. And he says, and he says, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jesus Christ humbled himself. Again, the perfect example. The Lord of Lord and King of Kings, the Savior of this world, got on his hands and knees and washed the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. He got on his hands and knees and washed them and dried their feet with, with his garment that he, that he put on. That's humbling. For the Savior of the world to wash feet. But that's what he did. And you know what? That's why his name is exalted above every other name. He humbled himself. He humbled himself to, to when, he, when he left heaven to be born in a human body, to be born and take on the limitations and then take on humanity. That's humbling. He humbled himself when he served others. He humbled himself when people ridiculed him and mocked him and spit in his face and beat him up. He didn't do anything. He told him, he told Pilate, he said, you think you have power over me, but you don't. He told him he was wrong. He said, you know, he could, he could have scores of angels go down and protect him at any moment if he wanted to. All he had to do was ask the Father and it would have happened. He didn't do it. He had humility and he had love. He knew what he had to do and he knew what, what needed to be done in order to save us. And out of his love for us, he did all that and suffered and bled and died. So we need to be wary of how we esteem ourselves. Make sure that you're not lifting yourselves up and thinking you're so much better than everyone else. But not only that, it's not just the way you view yourself. How do you esteem others? How do you think about other people? You may be thinking today, well, I don't really lift myself up that much. How do you think about other people? How much time do you invest in anybody else other than yourself? You say, well, I got to go to work. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to fix my... I gotta. If everything that you do in your life is just for you, you're not right with God. Let me say that again. If everything that you do in your day, when you spend, you think about your day from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, if everything you do is just about you, you're not right with God. We need to be esteeming others better than ourselves. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Now, when we esteem others, that means we care about them. That means we look on other people with love in our hearts. We look on other people as a way of, how can I help that person? Now, one thing that's, that's real popular, I think it's been popular all throughout history, because it's the way humans are, but it's wickedness, is to look on other people and just make fun of them. Make fun of them based on how they look. You know, when we live in an era now where with the internet and social media, and people can just post all this stuff, and it's just basically mockery and ridiculing people for the stupidest of reasons. Yeah. Just because of their appearance. Just because maybe someone's a little bit overweight. Just because someone has some kind of a problem, all of a sudden you're going to be mocking and ridiculing. What good does that do? Is that the attitude that Christ had? Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You see, oftentimes you might see someone who's extremely overweight. And you might want to make fun of that person because, oh man, they're so fat and this and that, and just, and just knock them down, right? And just, and just whatever, rail on them. And most of the time people would do it, they would never do that to their face. They just do it behind their back. Cowardly. But it would be a shame for them to, to, to do that to their face anyways, but to make themselves feel better. But you don't know what their story is. You don't know. Maybe someone has a medical condition. You don't know. Maybe someone's got a thyroid problem. You don't know. Maybe someone's dealing with something else in their life. And you don't know what's going on. But you're going to sit there and make fun of them. 
It's easy to make fun of other people that look a little bit different. But why do you care about the outward appearance at all? Why should it even be an issue? You know, there's a story in the Bible of people who mocked someone for their bald head. The story of Elisha. And it didn't turn out so well for those that mocked. And, you know, th it, this is an interesting story in the Bible. And a lot of people already know what I'm talking about here. But in 2 Kings chapter 2, you don't have to turn it. I'm going to read this for you. It's almost like, it almost doesn't even fit with the story. You got Elisha, he's going around, he's doing this stuff. He just followed Elijah. He got the, the double portion of the spear laid upon him. He's, he's starting to do his, his great ministry now and work for God. And he's traveling. And it says, and I'm going to read this for you in verse 23. And he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him. And said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. So all these kids, there's a big group of kids come out, and they all just start mocking and railing on Elisha, this man of God. And they're making fun of him. Why? Because he's bald. Right? Just some stupid, vain reason that doesn't mean anything. Oh, he's bald, so let's make fun of him. Right? This attitude. Well, you know what happens? It says, And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Forty-two of them died. Because they were cursing the man of God. Because they were, they were mocking the man of God. He cursed them for it. A lot of, a lot of lessons to be learned now. I'm not going to get into all that. But <clears throat> what a stupid thing to be ridiculing and mocking people just based on some appearance. Your heart's not right when you do that. Philippians chapter 2. This is how we ought to be. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the attitude that Jesus Christ had. He esteemed others in lowliness of mind. Bring yourself down a few notches and let each esteem other better than themselves. When you esteem other people better than yourself, you're looking at them and saying, they matter more than me. I'm going to help them out because they're more important than I am. I need to help them. It's about them. It's not about me climbing the, the ladder and doing everything for myself. I'm going to help them out. Now, everybody has some level where you have to take care of yourself. That's noted. That is obvious. But we need to be looking at other people. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You need to look to your own things a little bit. You need to be able to take care of yourself. But that's why it says also on the things of others. It's not just enough to take care of yourself. If you want to be a godly child of God, a, a, a righteous person, someone who's, who's doing what God has for them, and you appreciate the salvation that Christ has brought for you, then you need to be esteeming other people better and thinking about them more than yourselves and, and thinking, how can I be a blessing to someone else? How can I help these other people? And having that attitude, that's going to keep you from becoming conceited, becoming high in your own eyes when, you, when you're focused on other people. And, you know, I, and this is a little bit of a side note. This isn't even in my notes, but when people are dealing with depression, when people are dealing with, with you know, being depressed, with being sad, with having a lot of grief in your life, I have found that the reason that is is because you're focused on yourself. When you start thinking inwardly, you start thinking about me, and usually, I mean, there's all different reasons why people go through a lot of grief. There's a lot of reasons why people have, you know, they lost a loved one, right? Or, or, or something, some bad things are happening in their life. But what are they doing? They're thinking about me, 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 what bad, what are the bad happens to me, why me, why this, why God, why all this stuff happening to me? 
And that is a major reason why people start going into depression. They start focusing on themselves and all the things that are happening. And if you're focused on other people and helping them and saying, you know what, bad things are happening to me, but you know what, this person is more important anyways. That's actually going to bring you joy because when you help other people, it actually brings you joy. It makes you happy. It's good. You know, the, the Spirit will rejoice. You're born again. That Holy Spirit is going to rejoice when you're helping other people out. And you will just feel good by, by it being a blessing. I mean, it's, anyone who's helped anyone out knows that's a fact. Knows that it's nice to be able to, it's, it's rewarding. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. <clears throat> that's the attitude that Christ had. We need to follow his example. And we need to watch the things that we say and, and keep ourselves in check. You find yourself making fun of people. You find yourself looking down on people and making comments that are not edifying. They're not good. You know, you need to, you need to, to watch that in yourself and use that as an indicator and say, what did I just say? What am I doing? And get your heart right. The Bible says in Luke 6.45, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. The things that come out of your mouth, it's a heart problem. When you're saying the wrong things, when you're ridiculing people, mocking people, it's a heart problem. Right. It's not just the words. It's not just, oh, I shouldn't have said that out loud. You need to get your heart right. Amen. A lot of people could be thinking things in their head and not saying it out loud. You still got a heart problem. Turn if you go to Ephesians chapter 4. It's the last place we'll have you turn. Ephesians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We speak evil things. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse number 29. Ephesians 4.29 reads, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So he's saying, the words that you speak, the way that you communicate with people, don't let words come out that is corrupt, that is no good. What does he mean by that? Well, he says, the, the contrary of the corrupt communication is, speak that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying means building up. The opposite of building up is tearing down. When you mock people, when you ridicule them, what are you doing? You're tearing them down. You're doing no good for them whatsoever. We need to be saying things that will be edifying. And, you know, and keep this in mind. I mean, this is when you're talking about other people, again, go, kind of associated with the tail bearer a little bit, and you start saying things, and, oh, so-and-so is doing this, and so-and-so is doing that. Let's say someone screws up in this church. Someone in here that you know, one of your friends, they get into some kind of sin, right? They sin, and that's wrong, and it's the truth, and you see, you, know, you witness them do something, and then you go and tell somebody else, oh, I saw so-and-so do this. What good does that do anybody at all? Is there any edification going on when you're just... Telling someone now, I'm not talking about some major sin where someone would like need to get kicked out of the church because they're 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 committing one of the sins where he's just like, you know what, we need to break fellowship with this person. That's a different situation. But I'm just talking about just any average sin, right? Just some some something where you know someone gets involved in something. You see it. What good are you doing them? Or I mean, the person that you're telling now, all of a sudden, you're you're affecting the way that they're going to think towards the other person. They're going to think more negatively toward them. You're not helping the person who's sinning. You're not doing any good except just spreading rumors now and just, and just talking about people and backbiting. And it's wicked. The things that we say need to be done for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Keep that in mind. The way that we speak and the things that we say, they ought to be used for good. And not just to bring people down. The Bible says in verse 30 there, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you 
with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's another way to keep yourself humble. Remember what Christ did for you. Remember how your sins have been forgiven you. It's a lot easier to forgive other people. It's a lot easier to be long-suffering and merciful like God is when you think about how long-suffering and merciful He's been to you. And how many infractions that you've made against Him, yet He has forgiven you. That'll keep you humble. And that's the attitude and mindset that we need to have. What good are you doing to someone else? Now there are, you know, you think about, well, what about when people do wrong and they need to rebuke? Rebuking is actually helpful. When it falls on, on the right ear, on a, on a person who has wisdom, you get a rebuke, you're going to increase your wisdom, you're going to um, do better. And, you know, that doesn't mean that you're, um, it doesn't contradict the, the communication, the way that we're supposed to be, because there are ways that, that you can really be helpful to people. Like when you go, when you go out soul winning and you tell people that, you know, because they're an unbeliever, they're going to go to hell when they die. That's truth, and that's a fact, and that's not saying something in a mean spirit. That's actually saying something in a way to, to get them to, to realize the condition that they're in. But when you say something about someone just, you know, for, for vain reasons, for, for their appearance, for other stupid reasons, completely different scenario. And that's not the way that we ought to be uh, living our lives. We need to make sure we keep ourselves humble, that we keep ourselves in check, that we don't esteem ourselves too highly, and that we're esteeming other people better than ourselves. I'm going to close with Psalm 131. You don't have to turn. I'll read it for you. Just three verses. Psalm 131 reads, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. And this is just bringing up, look, I'm not lifted up. I'm not haughty. My soul is as a weaned child. I'm like a little child. And, and you know, children are humble. Why are children humble? Because they need to rely on their parents or on someone else to take care of them. They need, to, they need, they need things done for them. They need help getting themselves dressed. They need help feeding them. They need help in every single area. That's why they're humble. They're not going to be all lifted up and full of themselves when they can't do anything for themselves. And you know what? As we get older and we become adults, you start doing things for yourself. And you start maybe accomplishing a lot. And you start building these great works and you could do these great things and you have all these great accomplishments that you worked hard for to do. It's a lot easier to get puffed up and not be humble, but we need to remember and keep ourselves humble. We need to be going to God with all of our problems as little children. We need to be going to Him and say, you know what, I'm going to rely on Jesus. I'm going to rely on God. You know, God, give us this day our daily bread. God, help me just to, to be fed this day. That'll keep you humble when you have the mindset of going to God first and thinking of yourself as a child to Him. That'll keep you from getting too puffed up and full of yourself. We need to transform our minds. See, this is not the way that the world thinks. You're going to be programmed by this world to think differently. But we need to transform our minds and be renewed in our spirit and have the mind that Christ had to be esteeming others better than ourselves. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great truths, Lord. This is something that we need to deal with on, on a regular basis, God. I pray that you would please... Help us to get right with you. Help us to do what's right. And, and Lord, if we do spend all of our time not thinking about other people, not doing anything, especially for other people, dear Lord, help us to get right. Help us to start being more active in doing things to help others, dear Lord, to bring the love of Christ to other people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.